Hello, and welcome back to my small part of the universe. My name is Hailstone. Today, we will be going over a possible history of the ancients. There is much we don't know, and much we never will. And perhaps that is for the best. So today, I give to you a small thought experiment over their possible history. So please, if you will, sit back, relax, and let us begin. We were arrogant. Now we only exist as a way to feed it, and in tandem to keep us alive. Our civilization has crumbled. At the apex of our existence, we were the masters of our world. The only ones to arise out of the ocean of a small bleak moon in the middle of an unexciting void. Our environment was a harsh one, wrought with ravenous disease and numerous plagues. The predators were gargantuan, devouring entire slews of us. As all life had done before us, we adapted. The harsh conditions of our homeworld left only the most intelligent and clever alive, pushing our technology and evolution along by centuries. Soon we had conquered our homeworld, killing off its worst predators and retrofitting viral DNA and diseases to where they could no longer harm us. In time, we became tired of our world and turned our attention to the heavens. This was to be among our greatest of journeys, among the greatest of our engineering feats, boring through lengths of ice and rock until we finally hit the surface. This was to be the day of heaven's encumbrance. For as advanced as we were, our technology, our mathematics, and genetics paled to this new universe around us. But it didn't humble us. Over the next few years, we saw an unprecedented advancement in our knowledge of this void. Pundulant cycles, aerotology, and many other schools of thought concerning the heavens we now observed. First, we thought other systems were like our own, small icy rocks that laid in the rest of large gas giants. But this was not the truth for the jewels in the void, where ignited giants sent out large waves of heat to that which orbited, refracting off of each other, giving life to all that is seen. We were elated. With the conditions we were witnessing, the void must be full of life, much if not unlike ourselves. We worked tirelessly to cover the surface of our homeworld with all manner of sensitive receivers and detectors, eager to uncover the treasures that certainly awaited us, though we were not prepared for what we heard next. It was only silence. The void was by no means quiet. Only a chorus of broken, unintelligible signals radiating from every angle and depth. The systems we watched all seemed chaotic, too hostile for those like us. Were we merely a mistake? An aberration out of luck while the rest of the void seemed only hellish? The longer we listened, the more wonder was lost. We had spread out amongst the stars in order to listen as far as we could, but it was always the same result. Then we saw it. A perfectly stable system orbiting a Sarahel ignited giant containing two large ones like our own and two frozen. Furthermore, the data would suggest that there was a inner field of small rocky bodies orbiting the ignited giant closely. If this is true, this system may contain a treasure trove of information that could answer many of our wonders. Though this system was far from our homeworld, even so for our closest colonies. A massive ship was slated to be built, a living ecosystem that could support the needs of those required to make this journey. The years needed had little bearing on our lives as we could live for centuries without issue. With our plentiful resources, the ship was soon constructed, representing the true apex of our technology, and before long, it was dispatched to its destination. The ship and its crew spent many silent years crossing the void. Much of that time was occupied by thought experiments on what this system would be like, what treasures and information we would find. And each day, these thoughts and simulations could never prepare us for what was to come. Yet, they became more clear as well. This system was brimming with life and energy unlike any we had seen before. Many of the giants held worlds like our own and radically different, filling their skies with freezing ice and fire. What was more auspicious was that many of these worlds also held life, most residing deep below the icy crust, with life even presiding on one of their inner rocky worlds. Though it was decided to leave these motes of life alone until a proper colony and outposts were established for the long term. 
The location of the colony was chosen to be a world that encircled the first giant in the Outer Ring. Though, unlike our home world, the surface of this icy world was very active, showing little to no scarring and regularly showing signs of an active ecosystem well below its surface. The fauna of this world was very similar to ours, leviathans that lurked beneath its surfaces claiming wide swaths of territory to feed themselves, while smaller fauna rained themselves into small caves and upper currents. While true apex predators, none of them were true threats to us, easily corralled or tamed to our uses. Though, as we began to build our colonies and research stations, one of the mining teams reported a strange, almost alive material that seemed to hum with something analogous to life and energy. Yet, it wasn't, and it couldn't be accessed in a meaningful way. This material, this defiant material, soon became our obsession, distracting us from why we were truly here, and gave us a true cause. As a species, we were not unknown to the realms of genetic splicing. In fact, it was one of the many aspects that allowed us to conquer our world, allowing to take advantage of the adaptations of other forms of life and work them into our own. Though, this was never an easy prospect. The chance of genetic rejection was high, and forced us to employ cybernetics into our very beings. This was among the last of our tests of the Defiant Material, as it had proven to be elusive in all paths, despite being right in front of us. But there were two things that we learned of it. That it produced mind-altering effects if vibrated, or if struck against an unwitting subject. The first among us fitted with this material had it fused into their flesh paired with small sonic generators to excite the material. When the tests began, the volunteer became inert. Silence. Unmoving. At first we thought them dead, but no, it was more akin to being removed from reality. Being stuck between realms as if. As the experiment progressed, they began to hum if not sing. These emanations were more than mere sounds. They were incredibly dense streams of information that were almost impossible to figure. Vast amounts of knowledge that tore apart our devices that even attempt to store information, changing vastly between every nanosecond to something else being entirely unknowable. Obsession consumed us as we tried to make sense of every little piece we could grasp. But even if we knew what we ended up with, it was useless without the rest. We needed to know more. At this point, all colonization efforts had stopped. We ignored the calls from our home world, as the tunnels to the surface above and to our ship, our ark, froze over. Then, by sheer luck, we found an answer. From a little speck of the data stream, we pulled a device capable of recycling the humming into psychokinetic thought. But. It was made with materials we had never seen, nor were possible to exist in our reality, and many aspects of the device were unknown to us. But we had to know. Plans were conceived to grow a shell for a creature that could mimic this device. The shells would nearly rival our existing colonies, protected by a possibly hard shell, and automatic defenses that would keep it safe from curious onlookers. This washer would be implanted with only the smallest traces of the defiant material to prevent another removal. These creatures would be then set up into an array to capture and feed back the large amounts of data that emanate from the hum. Slowly, it began to make more sense. These were more than randomly changing streams of data. We were receiving instructions. It was commanding us to build something, to carve its flesh, to better receive the knowledge of the hum. It wants us to build a vessel, a colossal figure to conduct it. It promises so much. The answer to the void, the answers to life itself. It asks us to make a figure with the flesh of the Defiant as its anchor, and we shall. Mining the Defiant Ore became our priority. It seemed to be naturally attuned to the hum conducting its very energy to be directed into our reality, almost like it was leaking in from elsewhere, trying to puncture its way in to invade. Its skeleton was forged from Physicorium, a hardened material found deep in the abyss of this world. The skeleton was unlike anything we have witnessed before. Its limbs seemed to hold no proper purpose in this environment, and 
it compelled us to create a multitude of eyes and heads, one lower and one above. Why are we doing this? It promises so much knowledge, but none of it makes sense. What it promises, it's broken. It's... They have broken off, calling the name of creation a liar, making promises it will never keep. It only takes and has given nothing. They have broken off and retreated into the depths of this icy world below a giant. It is heart-wrenching that they do not understand. But when he is complete and taken back to the others, perhaps they will come to understand this construction, this magnum opus of our species. The hum is becoming clearer. It's singing up to us, praising us for building it. The more, the more that it is constructed, the more information we are fed. Anything we need at our beck and call, nothing will ever be out of reach again. Our grandest desires, the very designs of the world, and even life itself. But every answer that is given, hundreds of new possibilities and questions arise. It must become more clear and taken back with everyone that's able to hear the song. The very spark of creation will be within our reach. I understand it now. It's not a song. It's an emanation trying to will itself into existence. Yoweh, Yoweh. It's an echo of creation, birthed by the very spark of the beginning. It permeates all things, but the defiant material is more naturally attuned to it, giving it a presence in reality, more so than it would have elsewhere. Truly, this will be the foundation of breaking the walls of reality and convening with something primordial, something as old as the universe itself. My mind feels wrong. I can hardly tell what is real. Has my search for answers through this knowable tone warped my perception so? No, this isn't right. Every answer Yoei has given feels fragmented. When I can't hear the song, it makes less and less sense. Is it only telling me what I want or think to be right? Every time I draw closer to Yoei now, the sicker I feel. Something isn't right. It's like my mind is screaming at me to get away, balling up my guts in fear. Is this how they felt when they ran to the depths? To get away from this nauseating feeling? Almost as if a predator is about to strike from some unseen angle. But no, that can't be right. We are the masters of our environment. We are at the peak of technology and evolution. None of this is right. We've created a monster. A psionic parasite. It isn't your way. It only echoes the name to lure those with curiosity, then traps them with what they want to hear and what they want to make made right. That monster is complete and they're planning on taking it back to our home world. That cannot happen. I met with the others that fled to the depths. Our creation can't be allowed to interact with any large allowance of mines. If a chance arises after they take it to the ship in orbit, we are going to sink it into the giant above. This will strand us here, but perhaps that is our penance to not only keep our home world and other life in this system safe, but to our arrogance as well. I can only wonder, is curiosity like this the reason the rest of the universe is quiet? Instead of where life should be, instead it's drowned out by a chorus of alluring answers? Thank you for watching another one of my videos, and while we're at it, Merry Christmas. I would like to thank a member of my community, Fab Evil, for allowing me to consult with him over this script. His input was very helpful, and I enjoyed talking to him. Anyway, until next time, please have a great, safe rest of your Christmas.